You might be seated. That don't sound like my spot. You might be seated in Jesus' name. Before we get started, young man, now you have, one, this is your last chance. Any other eruptions, cussing, and crazy stuff, I'm going to bar you for life from this church. Now, we love you, but coming to church is a privilege. You can't come and harass people. Now, am I clear? All right. Now, this, I'm, I'm saying it. They, 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 they hear me streaming. The saints hear me. You are welcome to come here and to worship, but you cannot come here and interrupt. Are we on the same page? Thank you, sir. I don't believe that a ministry that's of God should be named after a man. Amen. That's right. Amen. Just like your churches out there, you name your church after the apostles or prophets. That's right. I admit that God's prophets and God's apostles had the perfect message. Mm -hmm. But God have never sent a prophet. God have never sent an apostle to name a religion. Mm -hmm. Or a church after them. That's right. The confrontation between Gino Jennings and Bishop Wooden over the authority to ban church members for life is a complex and multifaceted issue that delves deeply into the theology of church discipline, the exercise of pastoral authority, and the balance between justice and mercy within the balance between justice and mercy within the Christian faith. At its core, this debate highlights the differing interpretations of biblical principles and how they should be applied in the governance of a church community. Gino Jennings, the leader of the First Church of Our Lord Jesus Christ, is known for his uncompromising stance on biblical teachings and his forthright manner of addressing issues within the Christian community. His approach is often characterized by a strict adherence to the scriptures and a no-nonsense attitude towards what he perceives as deviations from the true teachings of Christianity. Jennings has built a reputation for being unafraid to call out other religious leaders and organizations when he believes they are leading their congregations astray. Bishop Patrick L. Wooden Sir, on the other hand, is the pastor of Upper Room Church of God in Christ in Raleigh, North Carolina, and has similarly established himself as a prominent figure in the religious community with a strong commitment to conservative values and strict church governance. Wooden's leadership is marked by a focus on maintaining order, discipline, and holiness within his church, which sometimes involves making difficult decisions regarding church membership and discipline. And I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Praise the Lord. And uh, sister, no more. Right there. Right there. Don't you post nothing else like you posted before about our church. You see me? You know who I'm talking to right here. Yeah, you. You know what you did. Now, we want you to come to church, but you have to do right by the church. This is our church. And our church is good to people. Our church is good to people. But you can't do things and then stay away for a minute and then come back and act like that wasn't done. Say amen. Everybody is welcome. But you know, most people don't know this, but a church is a private institution. The church controls who can come and who cannot. The specific incident that brought Jennings and Wooden into conflict revolves around Bishop Wooden's decision to ban certain church members for life. This decision likely stems from situations involving serious misconduct or behavior that wouldn't deem detrimental to the spiritual health and unity of the church. The practice of excommunicating or banning members is not unprecedented in church history. However, it is a practice that must be approached with great caution and sensitivity due to its significant impact on individuals' lives and their spiritual journey. No church can be called by justification. Mm -hmm. St. Paul, St. Peter, mm -hmm. Mary Church, Amen. the Church of Martha, the Church of the Brethren, that's no. That's right. no. That's right. That's right. John the Baptist Church, no. Oh, no. Amen. No. Preacher I saw on television, his, his ministry shouldn't even be named after him. That's right. If that's right. that ministry is of God. That's right. That's right. Because if that ministry is of God, the word of God says, whatsoever ye do, mm -hmm. in word or deed, do all. Oh. In the name of the Lord Jesus. So Jesus come along and teaches us mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Upon this rock, I'll build my church. That's it. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Well, that let me know God's church is different from everything else. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Because that means hell cannot prevail God's teaching. That's right. That's right. That's right. Geno Jennings' challenge to Bishop Wooden's authority in this matter is rooted in his interpretation of biblical teachings on forgiveness, repentance, and restoration. Jennings may argue that the concept of banning a church member for life contradicts the fundamental Christian principles of grace and forgiveness. According to this perspective, the church should always be a place where sinners can find redemption and a path to repentance. Jennings might cite passages such as Matthew 18, 21, 22, where Jesus teaches about the necessity of forgiving others not just seven times, but 77 times, indicating an infinite capacity for forgiveness. Moreover, Jennings could point to the parable of the prodigal son, Luke 15, 11, 32 as an example of the Father's unconditional love and readiness to welcome back a repentant sinner. This parable emphasizes the importance of grace and the belief that no one is beyond redemption if they genuinely seek forgiveness and turn away from their sins. For Jennings, a lifetime ban could be seen as denying individuals the opportunity to experience this transformative grace and to be restored to the community of believers. On the other side of the debate, Bishop Wooden might defend his decision by emphasizing the need to protect the integrity and sanctity of the church. From his perspective, allowing individuals who have committed egregious acts to remain within the church community without severe consequences could undermine the moral and spiritual foundation of the congregation. Wooden could argue that certain behaviors or actions are so damaging that they necessitate decisive and stringent measures to prevent further harm and to maintain the church's witness to the world. Wooden's stance might be supported by passages such as 1 Corinthians 5, where the Apostle Paul addresses the issue of immorality within the church and instructs the Corinthians to expel the wicked person from among them. Paul's directive here is not taken lightly. It reflects the seriousness with which early Christians approached the purity and holiness of their community. Wooden might argue that there are times when church leaders must take firm action to uphold the standards of the faith and to signal to the congregation and the broader community that certain behaviors are unacceptable and will not be tolerated. Furthermore, Bishop Wooden could invoke the concept of church discipline as a form of tough love intended to bring about genuine repentance and transformation. In this view, the ban is not merely punitive, but is designed to wake the individual up to the seriousness of their actions and to encourage them to seek true repentance. This approach aligns with the understanding that church discipline, when exercised properly, is meant to restore individuals to a right relationship with God and the church community, even if the process is difficult and painful. The tension between these two perspectives highlights the broader challenge faced by church leaders in balancing justice and mercy. On one hand, the church is called to be a place of grace, forgiveness, and restoration, embodying the boundless love of Christ. On the other hand, the church also has a responsibility to uphold biblical standards of holiness and to protect the spiritual well-being of the community. Navigating this balance requires wisdom, discernment, and a deep understanding of both the letter and the spirit of biblical teachings. In examining this confrontation, it is important to consider the context and motivations behind each leader's stance. Gino Jennings' ministry is characterized by a prophetic zeal for calling the church back to what he sees as the true and unadulterated teachings of the Bible. His challenge to Bishop Wooden is likely motivated by a desire to ensure that the church remains a place where all individuals, regardless of their past, can find a path to redemption. Bishop Wooden, conversely, is focused on the practical realities of leading a large and diverse congregation. His decision to ban certain members might stem from specific incidents that posed significant risks to the unity and health of the church. Wooden's actions could be seen as an attempt to navigate the complex and often messy realities of pastoral leadership, where the ideal of infinite forgiveness must sometimes be balanced with the need for accountability and protection of the flock. This debate also raises important questions about the nature of authority within the church. Jennings' challenge to Wooden's authority underscores the importance of accountability and the potential dangers of unchecked power within church leadership. It prompts a reflection on how authority should be exercised in a way that is both just 
and compassionate, and how church leaders can remain faithful to their calling while addressing the practical challenges of pastoral care. Ultimately, the confrontation between Gino Jennings and Bishop Wooden serves as a powerful reminder of the ongoing struggle within the Christian community to faithfully interpret and apply biblical principles. It highlights the diversity of thought and practice within the church and the need for ongoing dialogue and discernment. While Jennings and Wooden may disagree on the specifics of church discipline, their shared commitment to the gospel and the well-being of their congregations underscores the importance of seeking wisdom, humility, and grace in all aspects of church leadership. As the Christian community continues to grapple with these complex issues, it is essential to remember that the ultimate goal is to reflect the love, justice, and mercy of Christ in all that we do. Whether through acts of forgiveness and restoration or through firm and necessary discipline, the church is called to be a beacon of hope and a testament to the transformative power of the gospel. By engaging in thoughtful and respectful dialogue, leaders like Gino Jennings and Bishop Wooden can contribute to a richer and more nuanced understanding of how to faithfully live out the teachings of the Bible in a complex and ever-changing world.